Thank you, graduates, uh, for letting me celebrate this day with you. Um, what a fantastic day. Um, you know, I got to thank Principal Sumner in particular for his baseball metaphors made me feel right at home. Uh, I did learn that he is a Boston Red Sox fan. Uh, and I'm, so <laughs> I'm sorry I outed you. I outed you. I'm sorry. And I'm also uh, pleased to say that I'm not sorry for disappointing you this weekend. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I, I got to say, the way that the Blue Jays have been playing early on this year, it's nice to come to a place that abounds with grace. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, in, in, in preparing for a few words that I was going to say today, um, I really want to just speak from the heart, really, um, uh, based on my own experience in ministry and um, my own experience as a human being. Um, because I think one of the things that you guys have done that, that um, are members of the graduating class, that whenever you came on campus, you devoted your life to not only um, a life of growth spiritually, uh, but also a life of service. And um, I, I stand before you not in any way a self-made man. Um, I have been the product of a lot of people who have loved me and poured into me in a way that has transformed my life. Um, not only as a small child, but as I've grown um, an adult. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, share a little bit with you about that in hopes of leaving you with what I feel uh, could be something that you can take and uh, remember uh, in an effort to make a difference in the lives of other people, which you will inevitably um, be called to do in some capacity. Um, and so to that end, I got to the place that I was in my life about six years ago where I was at the end of myself. And I had um, spent some time, um, you know, I became a Christian when I was 13, but I didn't have, I didn't have the follow through that I probably needed. Um, and maybe some of that is attributed to living the life of a single parent kind of being ushered from home to home, and, or maybe it's um, another reason. But nonetheless, I found myself in uh, the fall of 2006 at the steering wheel of a car uh, with all the windows rolled up and a garden hose attached from the muffler to the passenger side window um, in hopes of ending it all. Uh, why? Because I had uh, done some things in my life and been the, been, um, come to the place in my life where I had real, realized that uh, I had made a, a lot of mistakes. And not only had I made a lot of mistakes, but I had been the victim of some things that uh, are tough to wrap your arms around. Uh, a Christian or not, um, tough, to, tough to wrap your arms around. So I was in that place and I was about to turn the key. And I really felt the Holy Spirit saying, R.A., uh, I am not done with you yet. Don't do that. Like literally those words, like do not do that. Um, and so as, as lonely as I felt in that moment at the steering wheel of uh, a Chevrolet Cavalier, uh, I never felt completely alone. Um, and I think there's something to be said in that. And I share that with you, and I'm vulnerable with you in this moment because I really believe that God has called me to be here um, for a reason. Uh, I, do, I do believe in, in divine appointments. I believe that this is one of them, and I'm, I'm thankful, like I said, to be here as part of this day, but also because I feel like God has something to say. Uh, and from then on, when I walked out of that car, um, I had the encouragement of my pastor at home to, to seek help from a Christian counselor. And some of you may end up in that place where you're a Christian counselor. Um, and it was there that my life was changed forevermore. And I think because I had to deal with a lot of stuff from a, a broken past and a very toxic past and a very dysfunctional past. And you guys will all, and maybe some of you guys out there know what I'm talking about exactly. And if you don't, you will certainly come in contact with people that do. I think one of the things that we share the common denominator, whether you're Canadian or American or, or African, or it does not matter. We are all bound 
uh, by adversity and tribulation to some degree. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Uh, maybe it's something far deeper. Um, but we're all together in that. And so a lot of my life from that point on and what I hope to leave you guys with as you go out into the world and you start to really have an impact in the lives of other people is this. And Peter talked about it earlier in my introduction. Um, I started to, to develop uh, disciplines and a mechanism and I started to possess the equipment through a lot of hard work to deal with what was very broken about the world, but what was also very beautiful about the world. And how, how do I go about my life being able to hold both the tragedy of this earth and the joy of this earth? And it was from there that I really started to grow both as a human being and as a pitcher. I started to be very transparent in my relationships after not trusting anyone for years and years and years, including my wife, um, which almost cost me my marriage. I have four beautiful children. I have a beautiful wife. And it's God grace, God's grace and mercy alone that, uh, that uh, we are and have a strong relationship now. Um, but it all was on the brink. And I, again, I share that with you to tell you that as I, as I continue to walk forward in this life, um, whether it's in the dugout at the Rogers Center or if it's here with you, um, God has given me the responsibility of trying to invest in every moment uh, in conversation and relationship um, with whomever um, and to try to devote myself to the discipline of sucking the marrow out of every second that I can. Um, I think that is what uh, God calls us to do. Uh, and, and Mark in particular, when he says to us that uh, to love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second commandment is this, to love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, even Victor Hugo, uh, an author who you, you guys may know, one of the lines in his, uh, his book, Les Mis, was I think to love another person is to see the face of God. You know, and I think that there's something that we can take out of that and really apply to our everyday lives. And that's what was done for me. That's what was done for me. And so I stand before you um, and have accepted the invitation to speak before you because I feel like uh, that is something valuable to understand is that you will be the Christian counselors in people's lives. You will be the pastors in people's lives, the friends, the mothers, the fathers, and your children's lives who will ultimately be able to communicate that truth. Um, and that is, in essence, the Great Commission, is it not? You know, to go and make disciples. And part of those, part of that making of disciples is within the network of our own families. And I, I have found in the community of baseball, and I'll give you a little bit of a window without getting too vulgar, because baseball players can be vulgar, right? Um, and athletes in general from time to time, as we see on ESPN, or I guess it's Sportsnet, right? Here, um, you know, in the, within the framework and the culture of baseball, to live uh, a Christian life is not always easy. Um, you know, I, I have uh, the responsibility of performing for 183 days for my baseball team. That's how, how many days in a baseball season, 162 games. Spring training is another 45 games. So let's say I'm on the road for half of those games. That's 81 plus spring training is another 41. That's 122 games that I'm away from home and away from my family. It's a very dysfunctional lifestyle. And, so, and it's a real challenge to try to live a life that would glorify God in, that, in the sense that you, you are called, I am called to be a father to my children. Thank God for Skype <laughs> and for, and for, I, and for iChat. Um, which has enabled me to, to be a, a parent from long distance, but we have to work hard at it. Um, but within the, within the culture of baseball, I am a minority. Um, within the clubhouse, uh, you know, usually you're looking at maybe five, six uh, believers. Um, and so it can be a, a, a real challenge. And I share that with you because uh, of the importance of community. Um, community has made a big difference in my life at home. 
Um, I, I've surrounded myself with people who I know and trust and know uh, that will love me well. And when I say love me well, that means tell me the truth. And so I would also encourage you as you go forth from today to invite people into your life that you know and trust to be able to, to pour into you. And it's not always pretty, right? Growth is painful sometimes. Um, I know it has been for me. Um, but at the end, I think the reward uh, is that you become uh, and develop a, a more intimate relationship with a living God. And so if one were to introduce me, if we could go back in opening day and I felt like it was kosher, I would say, please tell the PA guy to announce me as R.A. Dickey, starting pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays and the, living, of the child of a living God. I think that would be pretty powerful um, to do that. Uh, and so that is what you are. That's what we all are as believers in this community is we are all children of a living God and that's a powerful thing. And it's something that's life-saving. It's life-transforming. It's life-changing. And um, it does require discipline, sure. I think one of the things I learned when I took my daughters to India and I walked down, um, and I'll share this story in conclusion. I walked down uh, lane 16 of the red light district of Mumbai and I'll set the scene for you. Um, in India, especially in um, the major cities, the population is so dense, they don't really have the infrastructure to keep up with uh, sanitation. You know, so there's um, waste in the streets and, and sewage running along the sides of the, of the street. And, and in lane 16, which is a, is a, a place where there's about between between 600 and 1,000 women who have been trafficked in from surrounding areas, ages 10 to ages, you know, 40. And once they have served their time as a, a prostitute for the, the madams and the people who own the brothels, they become madams themselves. It's this terrible cycle, and a lot of children are born in to uh, that, that lifestyle. So when I took my girls over there, I did not expose them to that horror, um, but I did expose them to the redemption that occurs when a life is plucked out of that. And so I was walking down lane 16 and I was with the, the leader of the ministry um, who, whose name is KK Devaraj, who runs the Bombay Teen Challenge, which is a Christian ministry. Uh, and the way that the ministry works, the paradigm is that they work from the inside out. So they develop relationships with the prostitutes who have been trafficked in, the children of the prostitutes, the brothel owners, the madams. They start to develop these relationships. So for instance, if you have a prostitute who has died, then the brothel owner would, will call Bombay Teen Challenge to come pick the body up and take them and give them a dignified burial because that is really all they can hope for in that, in that point. It's bad for business if, if uh, there's a dead, a dead woman on the doorstep. And that's, that's the horror that we live in, right? That's part of the brokenness of this world. And so as I'm walking down lane 16, this girl who KK had had a previous relationship with um, through a clinic that we were able to open up, uh, comes to him and, and tells him, uh, and she must've been 24, 25 years old. She says, it's, it's too late for me. 24, it's too late for me, there's no hope for me, but can you take my son, right? And the son was six years old with open sores on his body, um, half of a diaper on, eating a rotten banana, standing at her feet. And so I, I thought to myself about what I shared with you earlier about how, how do I hold what's broken about the world and what's beautiful about the world? Because in that moment, it's all dark, right? So the only thing that I could lean on is hope, is hope and empathy. How can I grieve with this human being, you know, as well as celebrate with other human beings in a different place in life, in a different station in life? How can I do that fully? Because if you are given the tool of empathy, you automatically have a connection with another human being. And if we're really going to be candid here, um, this life is about changing other lives. It's about introducing people to the hope of Christ, right? And so in that moment, we couldn't obviously take the child away, but I'm happy to report to you that, that there have been um, measures taken 
uh, to get that child out. Now, it's a, it's a more difficult process to get the woman out, um, but the child um, has been rescued. And they take them to this place called Ashagram. And Ashagram is where all the people who have been rescued go. Um, and, and the way that it's set up is that everyone that comes out of the brothels in Mumbai uh, usually have HIV. And so they're immediately treated. They're counseled. Um, they're given a, a place to live, food, shelter. Um, they're taught about the love of Christ. And ultimately, they're educated in hopes of being able to re-enter into a society because they can't go back to where they come from. And what you guys will be doing as you grow in your ministry, whatever that is, is you will be giving a voice to people who don't have voices a lot of times. These women have come from places where they don't even have a birth certificate, where they're not even a tax number. So these recruiters will come in and they will, they will try to negotiate with the family a price to be able to take the woman away or the girl away uh, under the guise of being a, um, we, we'll let your girl come clean for, clean for these buildings. And then they are able to take them away. They pay them a sum and that's how it works a lot of times. A lot of times the family members will sell them into slavery as well. Um, but I tell you that story to point out this. And it's, it's hard for me to talk about in a sense, and I get kind of emotional because it's so real and it's so visceral. But you guys will, will take this with you and apply it even in other circumstances. But to be able to sit with another human being in their sorrow and in their grief is an incredible thing to have the capacity to do that. And it takes practice and it takes prayer and it takes you inviting other people to sit with you in your grief. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what transforms. And that's what Christ did. He sat with people in their sorrow, and he offered them a different life. And that's what you guys are going to be doing. And that fires me up. That fires me up. And that's hopefully what I can do, even in the culture of, of my clubhouse. Is that there are a lot of people with broken pasts, just like my own. Maybe they've been sexually abused. Maybe they've come from a broken family. Maybe they've had a drug addiction. Maybe they're presently grappling with things I know not of. But if I'm transparent and vulnerable and can sit with them in their grief, even if it's the smallest amount, then I will gain um, the ability to, to do relationship with that person. And those are the gifts that I've been given in my journey. And we all have personal narrative. You know, that's the one of the things that makes life so awesome is that we all have our own narrative. I have mine, you have yours, but at the end of the day, we're all connected in some way. And so part of making a difference in the lives of others is being able to empathize with another human being and able to offer them the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. And so with that, I just want to say, may God bless you and keep you now and forevermore. Thank you.